So today, the presentation is Killer Fashion, the Plume Boom, Female Activism, and Bird Conservation at the Turn of the 20th Century. And this is basically the story about how the environmental and conservation movement in America grew out of fashion and was driven by women. I didn't know that happened. It was a big surprise to me, and I'm excited to share it with you. Uh, so today, to this day, these movements that came out of that and the laws helped to protect our migratory and resident birds here in St. Martin. So feathers before the turn of the 20th century had already been used to create fashions for centuries. And in many cultures, uh, feathers were a symbol of high status, elegance, wealth. There are feathered cloaks in Polynesia that are only for the chief. Uh, in Roman times, they had feathers as part of the high-ranking officers' uniforms. It's, it really cuts across cultures to be a symbol of fanciness and, and money. Um, so when we get to the 20th century, it wasn't using feathers in fashion that was the new thing. It was just the like sheer insane volume of it when this fashion trend went out of control. So in the late 1800s and early 1900s, feathers just blow up fashion-wise. They become a massive, massive trend in North America and in Europe. And the style in hats at the time were these ginormous concoctions. Um, and feathers became one of the most sought after decorations for these hats. Um, and Mark made a good point when he saw this presentation last night. He was like, well, if you have a giant hat and you're going to put a lot of stuff on it, it would be better if that stuff was not very heavy. And birds have evolved feathers over millions of years to be not only beautiful, but also lightweight and strong. So it's in some ways a very good choice to, if you're going to pile a bunch of feathers on an enormous hat, like feathers are a good choice if you're going to pile something on there. I mean, you can put a lot of feathers on hats like this. Um, so, but the mania for decorating hats wasn't just for feathers. Um, they started using entire wings of birds um, or just whole taxidermy bird on your hat um, was really, really common. Or flocks of taxidermy birds. Uh, yeah, so come, looking at these archival photos was just stunning, like seeing what was happening at the time. Um, yeah. So women were not the only ones wearing feathers on their heads and in their fashions. Uh, they were also used in men's hats and fashions, including military uniforms. Um, every single British infantryman at the time had feathers as a part of their uniform. Uh, they used the feathers of the snowy egret, actually, which we know here from St. Martin. So if you think about how many people were in that army, that's a lot of egrets. Um, so feathers, wings, and whole birds were used for other stuff besides hats. Like they started using them to decorate these high-end fans. So these were very expensive fans. These are some late Victorian fans, and you can see they're like entire little hummingbirds on these fans. Um, feathers and birds were also used for muffs, capes, dresses, and even jewelry and hairpins. There would be people who had like whole hummingbirds or songbirds surrounded by jewels, and that was like a, a brooch. You can see here there's like a muff and a stole made out of a seabird. Um, this is a hair ornament made out of snowy egret. And you can also see here, it's like a little capelet or a stole that's made out of feathers as well. Um, and these were luxury items. Uh, these were not mass market items. These are luxury items that are snapped up by people with money who are hungry for more and more feather fashions. As the trend keeps growing, getting more out of control, uh, the feather market balloons to keep up with this demand. And feathers became this big business. And that was not good news for birds. So 
the plum boom is the word that is used to describe this explosion in the feather trade that happened in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It became this multi-million dollar a year industry. And that's in back then money, that's not today's money. So you can imagine like the scale of how much money this was making for people. It was huge. And uh, the prices that you could charge for plumes and feathers were astronomical. In 1886, they were selling for more than $20 an ounce, which is more than $500 in today's money. By the early 20th century, that had gone up to $32 an ounce. And this, at the time, made feathers worth more than twice their weight in gold. Um, so the people that got these feathers for the plume industry were called plume hunters. And uh, you're probably wondering, where did they get these valuable items? They were not going down to Florida or the Caribbean and sort of like strolling after gorgeous birds and just hoping that a feather or two would drop out. This highly profitable industry was built on the almost entirely unregulated, meaning no rules, slaughter of hundreds of millions of birds across globe. So hundreds of millions of birds. Um, and this plume boom massively decimated bird populations all across the Americas, in the Caribbean. By, you know, just the start of the 20th century, there were many species that were almost completely annihilated by this, by being killed so that upper class women could make a fashion statement. Okay, by 1886, which is the early part of the plume boom, when it's just starting to kick off, there are already over 5 million birds a year being slaughtered just for the North American millinery business or the hat making business. Um, if you went to retail stores on Manhattan's Ladies Mile, which was the big shopping district, uh, you could go into these stores and you could buy feathers from snowy egrets, white ibises, great blue herons, you name it, you could find it. Like, there was a bird watcher who lived in New York City at that time. His name was Frank Chapman. Uh, and he did a fascinating kind of field study on the streets of New York that same year. It was fascinating, but it was also really depressing because he was like, I can just watch, I'm a bird watcher and I can just go out of my house and watch dead birds on people's heads. Um, so he was like, I'm gonna take two afternoons and I'm gonna walk from my office uh, you know, in uptown Manhattan, I'm going to walk down to 14th Street where the big fashion district is. And I'm just going to look at people's heads, like I'm going to look at their hats. And he saw that three quarters of the hats that he observed had feathers. Uh, he counted all this stuff, dead birds on people's heads, and all together he counted up 174 birds and 40 species. Two afternoons on a stroll. Um, so that can kind of give you an idea of like the volume of what was going on. Another way to figure out the volume is if you check out the records of hat makers and the feather traders, the people that were selling the feathers from the time, and you imagine the scale of death that that represents, it's actually pretty mind blowing. Uh, for example, a single shipment to just one London hat maker was 32,000 dead hummingbirds. 80,000 aquatic birds and 800,000 pairs of wings. One shipment to one hat maker during this whole period, just one. Um, there's a guy named W.T. Hornaday. He was an ornithologist who took a look at a lot of these records. And he was able to calculate that uh, over about 130,000 snowy egrets were slaughtered for the London plume markets alone in just one nine month period of this plume boom time. And similar volume was happening in the feather auctions in New York City. New York City and London were like the biggest, most rapacious centers for this feather trade. Um, and there were a ton of egrets that got killed for it because snowy egret feathers were very fashionable. Uh, which made them enormously popular in this feather trade. Um, and the reason is because when they're breeding, they have this like beautiful 
filmy, fancy breeding plumage. Um, and it's for this reason that snowy egrets were massacred almost to extinction during this plume boom, including here on Seymour. Um, so plume hunters would travel to places like St. Martin in Florida to slaughter snowy egrets during nesting season. Snowy egrets uh, nest in colonies, so there's a big group of them all together, so that made it very convenient if you're a plume hunter and you wanted to get a ton of feathers at once. Um, and they would go during nesting season for another reason as well, it's because they still have their breeding plumage, those fancy feathers that they were sought after for, but they also were, they would wait until they were taking care of their chicks because they were less likely to move and go away. They were taking care of their children. So the plum hunters would wait until this was happening and then they would go in and they would wipe out whole colonies. They would shoot and skin the adults and they would leave the helpless children who were unable to fly to starve to death in the nest or be eaten by predators. And there are a lot of like, Contemporary accounts of this hunting technique, uh, specifically for snowy egrets, but also for other birds, but they describe in this really like heart-wrenching way these poor chicks, like desperate, like starving, calling out for their parents who are dead and can't come. And it was, um, yeah, it was just very, um, you know, the technique is not a sustainable technique. If you are trying to exploit a resource and you wipe out any chance of it continuing, you're also kind of like messing yourself up for the future of this industry continuing. But um, I don't think they were really concerned about sustainability at the time. But you can understand why using this technique, the whole species was almost totally killed off. And it was killed off in a, in a really brutal way. And, like I said, people started writing about it. People started taking pictures of it. Um, this is from a famous series of photos depicting that. And people, largely women, started organizing to stop it. So the early 20th century was a really interesting time for women, like just before and just after. There was, there was a boom in female activism as well. There were women getting together and organizing to do things like mobilize to get the vote or for the temperance movement. Um, there were a lot of things that women were starting to get together and uh, get power for, including uh, protecting wildlife. So in the US, there was a two woman dream team that basically brought down the whole feather trade and at the same time, jump-started the conservation movement. Um, this is one of them. She's a Boston socialite uh, named Harriet Hemingway, and she was an amateur, she was an amateur naturalist, so she was already into nature, and she was an avid birder. Um, and in 1896, she reads one of these, like, heartbreaking accounts of the, like, hardcore slaughter of the snowy egret and other birds for the feather trade, and she's like, oh, this is insane, this is horrible, like, we have to stop this. Um, you know, we can't be killing millions of birds in this horrible way and massacring these species to extinction for hats. Like, this is completely bonkers. So she immediately marches right across the street to her cousin's house. Her cousin is a woman named Minna B. Hall. And Harriet tells Minna about everything. She explains the whole thing to her, and Minna is like, I'm down, let's do this. So they start strategizing on how to stop this feather trade. And they're like, okay, it's upper class women like us who are buying these fancy, fashionable hats that are driving this murderous millinery trade. So we have to get these women to stop buying these hats with feathers. Uh, we have to make it unfashionable. So basically we have to change fashion in order to save these birds. How are we going to do that? And they're like, let's party. Harriet and Minna kick off their revolution by inviting all the women on the Boston Blue Book Social Registry to a series of fancy tea parties. And at these parties, when they get them at these parties, 
they tell them all about the horrors of the feather trade and they convince them to boycott feathered hats and they get them to tell all their friends about it too. So they fought to change the fashion and they also fought to change the law. Ultimately, Harriet and Minna are able to recruit 900 women to their cause. And this group actually became the Massachusetts Audubon Society. And then all the other states like started founding their own Audubon societies to join this fight against the feather trade. And all of these societies were about 80% women. So women are very strongly behind this effort to fight the feather trade. And it's also pretty amazing that Harriet and Minna's group grew to what eventually became the National Audubon Organization that helped create the first national wildlife refuge and the first national and international laws that protect wildlife. So once Harriet and Minna have the Massachusetts Audubon Society, they immediately start using its political power. Um, just a year later, after they started throwing their parties, they had a state law passed in 1897 to outlaw trade in wild bird feathers. And then in 1900, they get the Lacey Act passed, which prohibits the interstate shipment of animals killed in violation of local law. So it doesn't matter whether you killed it somewhere else, you're just not allowed to be selling that stuff and transporting it back and forth. So their efforts also led to the signing of the International Migratory Bird Treaty in 1916. And this year, we're celebrating the centennial of this law. So happy birthday to this law. And this, in turn, led to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And that was signed in 1818. And to this day, it remains one of the strongest laws protecting wild birds. These were really, these were the first kind of this type of law. They were really landmark laws for conservation. And that's part of the reason that Minna and Harriet are known as the mothers of conservation. These laws that they help to get passed are still protecting migratory birds and other birds worldwide today, including the birds right here on St. Martin. So thank you ladies for getting those laws passed. And thank you to Le Cui de Mer, a museum naturalist, the University of St. Martin, Mark Yokoyama, who put together this beautiful and all of you for coming to see it.